Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 13th. Today, we celebrate the woman who has been called the greatest painter of plants and insects who ever lived, and the birthday of a man who's remembered in the name of one of the most ubiquitous garden plants. We'll learn about an Austrian-American plant explorer who grew to feel that his real home was in China. And we'll learn about today's tradition, Plow Monday, the first Monday after the 12 days of Christmas. Today's unearthed words feature sweet poetry from a little-known woman who lived in Concord, Massachusetts. She was a suffragist, animal rights activist, and American poet. And we grow that garden library with a book that helps us turn our gardens into a sanctuary for restoration and healing. I'll talk about a simple garden item that serves a great purpose and looks great with a simple terracotta pot. And then we'll wrap things up with an article from the 1930s about how to propagate a popular houseplant through air layering. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. Today's curated articles start out with a post from Gastro Obscura called Around the World in Rare and Beautiful Apples. The post is about William Mullen, who takes gorgeous photos of rare and beautiful apples. His images will open your eyes to the wider spectrum of varieties of the fruit known as apples. Some of them actually look like potatoes and some of them are positively pink inside. If you'd like to read this post in the Facebook group for the show, just search for apples and this post will pop right up. Next up is a post from Cornell College out of Iowa. It's called The Giants of Cornell. And actually, it's a treatise, meaning history professor Catherine Stewart visited eight trees on the hilltop at Cornell College, and she wrote about each imagining what they might tell us if they could speak. Her words appear next to the image of each tree. Catherine's post features the cottonwood, the redbud, the blue spruce, larches, magnolia, ginkgo, and white ash. And here's one of her entries. It's for the blue spruce. She gives the botanical name Picea pungens, the locations of this tree on campus up on the hilltop, and then she identifies it. The blue spruce has a pyramidal shape with horizontal, dense branches with sharp blue needles. The bark is silver, gray, and brown with vertical scales. And it's known for providing homes to wildlife in winter. And then this is where Catherine incorporates her own verses about this tree. She wrote, most likely to assist you with time travel. If you look long enough and lean in and breathe in the elixir of its scent. When I shared this in the Facebook group, I said, take a moment and treat yourself by reading this wonderful article. Couldn't resist that pun. Anyway, if you want to see this post in the Facebook group, just type in tree and this post will pop right up. Now, if you'd like to check out these curated articles for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of them with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show, the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or track down links. The next time you're on Facebook, just head on up to the search bar, type in Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the anniversary of the death of the naturalist and botanical illustrator Maria Sibylla Mirian. She was born on April 2nd, 1647. As a frame of reference, Isaac Newton was only a few years older than her. 
Unlike Newton, Merian's work was largely forgotten over time. But during the past century, her work has been rediscovered. In 2011, Janet Daly, a retired teacher and artist from Springfield, Illinois, became so captivated by Miriam's life story that she started a Kickstarter campaign to follow Miriam's footsteps to the mecca of her best work, Suriname, in South Africa. And in 2013, Miriam's birthday was commemorated with a Google Doodle. Miriam would have been delighted with our modern day effort to plant milkweed for the monarchs. The concept that insects and plants are inextricably bound together was not lost on Miriam. In her work, she carefully noted which caterpillars were specialists, the ones that only ate one kind of plant. You can relate to that concept. If your kid only wants to eat mac and cheese, hey, they aren't picky. They're specialists. For centuries, drawing like Miriam's were a holy grail for plant identification. One look at Miriam's work, and Linnaeus immediately knew it was brilliant. Miriam helped classify nearly a hundred different species long after she was gone from the earth. To this day, entomologists acknowledge that the accuracy in her art is so good that they can identify many of her butterflies and moths right down to the species level. Between 1716 and 1717, during the last year of her life, Marian was visited multiple times by her friend, the artist George Gazelle, and his friend, Peter the Great. Oh, to be a fly on the wall for that meetup. Gazelle ended up marrying Marian's youngest daughter, Dorothea Maria, and Peter the Great ended up with 256 of Miriam's paintings. In fact, Peter the Great so loved her work that when Miriam died shortly after his last visit, he quickly sent an agent to buy up every one of her remaining watercolors. The agent was on the case. He bought her entire collection of paintings and then promptly brought them all back to St. Petersburg, where they remain to this day. And today is the anniversary of the death of the Austrian botanist and physician Nicholas Thomas Host, who died on this day in 1761. Host was the physician to the Austrian emperor in Vienna. The genus Hosta was named for Host by the Austrian botanist Leopold Tradenick in 1812. Hostas were brought to Europe by the Dutch nurseryman Philip Franz von Siebold. He had visited Japan and brought specimens back to his Leiden nursery. This is why Hosta Sieboldiana is a famous prefix to so many Hosta varieties. Hostas are dependable and tough. They are undemanding herbaceous perennials that give us lush greenery in shady spots. Hostas belong to the Asparagaceae family, along with asparagus, agave, lily of the valley, sansevieria, yucca, and hyacinth. The common name for hosta is plantain lilies. They used to belong to the lily family. Nicholas Host died in 1834. And today is the birthday of the renowned Austrian-American botanist and explorer Joseph Rock, who was born on this day in 1884. Joseph was born in Austria, but he ended up emigrating to the United States and eventually settled in Hawaii, where he was beloved. 
Joseph became Hawaii's first official botanist. He started teaching as a professor of botany at the University of Hawaii in 1911. He also served as a botanist for the Hawaiian Territorial Board of Agriculture. He served in these capacities during his first 13 years in Hawaii, and then he got about the business of exploring China, which was his primary passion. He left Honolulu in 1920, and he always said that he considered China to be his real home, where he said, life is not governed by the ticking of a clock, but by the movement of celestial bodies. Joseph spent much of his adult life, more than 20 years, in southwestern China. There were many instances where he was the first explorer to enter many of the locations he visited. Joseph became so embedded in the country that there were many times that his counterparts in other parts of the world thought he might have died in the Tibetan or Yunnan mountains. After World War II, Joseph had to be evacuated by plane from the Yunnan province. Joseph recounted many hair-raising stories from his time in China. One time he'd collected plants along the base of Mount Ganga in China's Tibetan border region. Mount Ganga is known as the King of Sichuan Mountains. One spring, Joseph had great luck collecting around the base of Mount Ganga. When he returned in the fall, Joseph asked the tribal king for permission to go as far as the foot of the peak. Halfway up Mount Ganga, a runner caught up to Joseph and his guides with a letter from the king. Apparently, after their first collecting trip, a severe hailstorm had destroyed the fields of the tribe that lived near the mountain range. The tribe blamed the catastrophe on Joseph Rock and his party. They believed that the deity of the mountains was not pleased. The tribe considered the mountains to be sacred. If Joseph and his party were to continue up the mountain, they would certainly be killed. The king requested that Joseph abort the trip, which he did. In addition to plants, Joseph had a knack for languages. He cataloged and transcribed Chinese manuscripts, and he actually wrote a dictionary of one of the tribal languages. He had an enormous intellect and was multi-talented. In addition to being a botanist, he was a linguist, and he was regarded as a world expert cartographer, ornithologist, and anthropologist. From a gardening standpoint, it was Joseph Rock who first introduced blight-resistant chestnut trees to America. He had sourced them in China, and he also brought us more than 700 species of rhododendron. Some of his original rhododendron seeds were successfully grown in the Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. How could we ever thank him enough for that? In the year before Joseph died, he was granted an honorary Doctor of Science degree from the University of Hawaii. He died at the age of 79. And it's official. The holidays are over. Today is Plow Monday. Plow Monday is regarded as the traditional start to the agricultural year and the official end to the holiday season. For me, Plow Monday is the day I'm going to plow through all of my returns. But seriously, Plow Monday is always the first Monday after the 12th night of Christmas, and it represented men's work. 
For centuries, Plow Monday represented the day that agricultural workers returned to the fields after resting over the Christmas season. On Plow Monday, farmers would bring their plows to church so that they could be blessed. Nice tradition. In unearthed words, Today is the birthday of the suffragist, animal rights activist, and American poet, Hannah Rebecca Hudson, who was born on this day in 1847. Not much is known about the life of Hannah Hudson, but gardeners love her poetry. Hannah's beloved poem called April was featured in the Atlantic Monthly in April of 1868. Here's what she wrote. April has searched the winter land and found her petted flowers again. She kissed them to unfold her leaves. She coaxed them with her sun and rain and filled the grass with green content and made the woods in clover vein. Her crocuses and violets give all the world a gay good year. Tall irises grow tired of green and get themselves a purple gear. She fills the dusk of deepest woods with vague sweet sunshine and surprise and wakes the periwinkles up to watch her with their wide blue eyes. And when she sees the deeper suns that usher in the happy May, she sighs to think her time is past and weeps because she cannot stay. So leaves her tears upon the grass and turns her face and glides away. In 1874, When she was 27, Hannah published a book of her original poetry. Hannah was a charter member of the Woburn Woman's Club. At the age of 74, Hannah died sitting at her aunt's kitchen table in Woburn, Massachusetts. Hannah is buried at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, Massachusetts. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Creating Sanctuary by Jesse Bloom. This book is a favorite of mine. Rosemary Gladstar, the herbalist and author, said this about Jesse's book. In this inspiring, beautiful, and practical book, we are invited to look deeply at the landscape around us and create sacred respites from our busy worlds. Creating Sanctuary is about creating a garden that will nourish your spiritual and emotional well-being. Jesse's beautiful book is chock full of ideas. You'll learn to discover the powerful and beneficial properties of plants and how to incorporate nature-based routines and rituals. With the help of Jesse's book, you can turn your garden into a sanctuary, a place of true restoration for your mind, body, and soul. Jesse's book came out in November of 2018. You can get a used copy of Creating Sanctuary by Jesse Bloom and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $10. And here's a great gift for gardeners. It's a six pack of plant saucers. They're two and a half inches round. They're made of bamboo and you get the entire set for $9.99. These bamboo saucers have a slightly raised edge, which is great for collecting excess water. And they're a natural wood color. So they look simple. They're beautiful and they match with most pots. I like to pair mine with my little terracotta pots. I think it dresses them up a little bit. You can get this six-pack of bamboo plant saucers and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $10. 
<laughs> Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today, the Pittsburgh Press shared a story about how to propagate a rubber plant on this day in 1935. It starts out this way. Yes, you can get a new rubber plant by air layering the old. To do this, a V-shaped cut is made in the branch, almost severing it. The cut should be made near the growing tip, and then a wedge is inserted to keep the cut open. Bind the wound all around with some sphagnum moss, tying it with raffia or a cord. Keep this bandage quite moist, never allowing it to dry out, and keep the plant in a warm place. In a month or six weeks, small white roots will appear. Then the new plant can be cut from the parent and planted in a pot of its own without removing the moss bandage. The place where it's cut from the large plant may be rubbed with a little dry sulfur and it will quickly heal. The young plant in a five or six inch pot should be kept shaded for a week then it can be brought into the light and watered. January to May is the time of year most seasonable for this work, but it may be done with varying success year round. It's a great post from way back in 1935. Rubber plants, Ficus elastica, are popular ornamental house plants from the Ficus genus. For gardeners looking for a tree-type plant species with attractive large foliage, the rubber plant is an excellent choice. It's also a great low-light specimen. So if you have a place in your home that just doesn't have great light, the rubber plant could be the perfect selection for that spot. Water your rubber plant at least once a week and clean the leaves monthly. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org. And be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.